So in this video today, I'm going to go over how to use the process plugin in SPSS by Andrew Hayes to do what I would call a moderated me uh, moderated moderation model or three-way interactions. And so this is model three um, in the process plugin, which you can see in the picture here. So uh, let me explain to you kind of what's going on. I don't have the best example for this um, demo, but I can show you how to run it on your own data. And so I have a data set that has student success as the dependent variable. Uh, so if we're trying to measure um, engagement and uh, GPA and like a combined sort of like, are they going to be able to matriculate through the university? So we have our student success variable. Um, for X here, we have an ACT score, but we've used it as a cutoff score. So there are um, specific cutoff scores that at least our university uses to allow students into a regular version of an English class or a math class. And if they make below a certain score, they have to take a remedial class first. So we're kind of seeing if that ACT score actually predicts the success in this course. And so is it a good criterion to use? Uh, our moderator variables include student GPA, so high school GPA, but it's scaled, so it won't be in your normal GPA um, <clears throat> scale and then hours studied according to the student. Okay, so we're going to use both of those as moderator variables but um, even though you can put multiple things in M in the process window you want to make sure you match it to the model that you're using so we're going to use M and W. And so what this picture denotes is that there is a moderation of M on the relationship between X and Y. So there's an interaction between X and M to predict Y, but there's also W. And so W moderates the relationship between M and X and Y. And so essentially what that amounts to is a three-way interaction between X and W and M, and then all of the two-way interactions. So X and W, X and M, and then uh, W and M. If you want to look at the statistical diagram, you can see that a little better. So we have our three main effects of M, X, and W on Y. And then I have my two interactions with M, my one interaction with W, and the three-way interaction. So this is essentially um, a three-way interaction with the process plugin helping us out. All right. So we're going to use model three. And here's the data set. Um, <clears throat> And so all of this will eventually be available on our design site we're designing right now, statstools.com, and you'll be able to practice on this actual data set. But for right now, if you need the data sets, hopefully in a couple weeks this part of the video will be useless, um, you can send me an email. Uh, my email is aaronbuchanan at missouristate.edu or aggieerin, A-G-G-I-E-E-R-I-N, at gmail.com. Um, or you can just contact me through YouTube, that works too. All right, so getting into this data, I first want to do my data screening um, because it's important to look for outliers and I already know I have some in this data set and we'll have to decide what to do with them. So um, if you've watched some of my other videos, you know, have a very specific order for data cleaning. So we're going to start by checking for missing data. So to do that in SPSS, I'm going to do analyze, um, descriptives, and then frequencies. You move all of your variables over, so let me reset this. So I'm going to move all of them over. <clears throat> I'm going to turn off frequency tables because these are continuous variables and it'll give me a ton of output if I don't. And it warns me that unless I do something else, I am wasting my time. So let's click statistics. And then at least ask for the min and the max. Um, and that will give me um, <clears throat> uh, any out of range scores as well. I already know this data is within range. So I'm going to hit continue and OK. And so the first thing that does is it gives me a box that tells me what I have um, for my minimum max. So these scores um, don't necessarily match what you'd expect for GPA because we scaled it a certain way. Um, and then hours uh, attended some study sessions. I have their six actual success score and my ACT score is either below or above the cutoff. Um, I have some missing data here, so I have two in the GPA and two in the success in the core, or one in the success in the course, and then 24 in this hour studied. Now I probably don't want to fill that variable in because that's 10% of the data, so I would want to leave that out. Um, 
Now the for scale GPA, I could probably fill that in because it's only two people. Um, and then for success in the course, I tend to avoid filling in the dependent variable um, <clears throat> because that's what you're trying to predict, and so you're guessing at a, a an average score usually. Um, but you could because it's only one data point. It really probably won't affect a whole lot. But for this data set, I'm just going to fill in the two missing for skill GPA and then leave everything else alone. And then SPSS will ignore those because they're missing. So you can do that fairly easily under transform and then replace missing values. The best option in SPSS is linear trend at point, which you need to change first. So otherwise it will automatically do series mean. So often you can move stuff to the right and then um, click on what you're wanting to include, but this is one of the weird windows where you need to change it first. So let's do linear trend, and I just want to do GPA. And you'll see here that says trend, so that's how I know that it changed. Okay. All right. So I'm actually going to get rid of... So let me save this as a new file real quick. I'm actually going to get rid of my first GPA column so that I'm not tempted to use it. Now, when you're doing this sort of thing, I always tell people to save it as multiple data sets so you have that original data somewhere else. Um, but And then get rid of the columns that you aren't using so you're not tempted to um, fill in missing data and then analyze the non-filled in column. That happens a lot. All right, so we've gone through missing data and dealt with that. Everything else we're going to leave missing pairwise. Let's deal with outliers. Now, we're actually going to run this analysis with multiple interactions, but what I want to do is screen the data before we create these interactions. Um, you could also create the interactions and screen those, um, but generally, since those interactions are part of the main effects, people who have outliers and main effects aren't going to suddenly go away because of the interactions. <clears throat> And so to do that, since this is a real regression, we can sort of run a, a non-interaction regression to analyze that data. So let's go analyze, regression, and then linear, because you can't do this sort of thing in the process window. Um, so what I want to do is use my success in the course as my dependent variable, because that's going to be my dependent variable in the analysis. I'm going to put all three of my IVs in the independent variable box, and I am going to use those to predict as main effects. Under plots, I'm going to do Z pred and Y, Z residual and X. That will give me my um, histograms and my residual scatter plots. And so I want to click on both of these and my normal probability plot for linearity. Okay, so histogram and normal prob probability plot. Say continue. Under save, we're going to click Mahalanobis, Cooks, and Leverage to check for outliers. And continue, and OK. Uh, so first thing it did was actually give me the regression. So I could kind of see like what my regression is going to look like, but that's, kinda, that's cheating. So I'm going to go back and look at my Mahalanobis scores here. So I'm going to sort those descending. So right click, sort descending. And then I'll put the biggest ones at the top. Well, how do I know what's wrong? Like, what scores are bad? So I have a chi-square table here. And remember that you want to use 0.001. So we want to find scores that are very odd before we start deleting anybody. <clears throat> and so let's see. So for 3, a cutoff score of 3. How did I get 3? Well, I have 3 independent variables. So those you want to use a degrees of freedom with a number of k variables. And so that's 3. I've got x, w, and m. And then I want to use 0 0.001, so 16.27 will be my cutoff score for Mahalanobis. Right. So I have three Mahalanobis outliers. Um, and then I'm going to use the best 2 of 3 rule and make sure I only delete people who are outliers in multiple ways in a regression. Because often people can be discrepant, they can be far away from everybody else, but not have any leverage, which means control over the slope. So the people that you really don't like are the ones who have big control over the, and they move the slope up and down, because we want our slope to be fairly consistent. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use all three of these and look at if a person has an outlier on at least two out of the three, and then I'll think about deleting them. So how can you keep track of that? Because it's a lot of scores at once. 
we're going to use the, the recode function um, in the transform window to help us do that. So I'm going to um, recode in different variables. So transform recode into different variables. You'll kind of see what's going on here in a second. So I'm going to take my Mahalanova score and I'm going to call this Mahal out. Uh, and what that will do is create me a variable that is simply a zero or a one that tells me if that person is an outlier or not on that one score. Okay, so we're going to have to do this three times because you can't use the same cutoff score for all three columns, but it doesn't take that long. Okay, so I've got my old and new values. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is range value through the highest. So I'm going to take my cutoff score, which is 16.27. And I want to say everybody whose score is 1627 or higher, I want to make them a 1 for yes, an outlier. Hit add. And then all other values, I'm going to make zeros. No, they're not an outlier. And then add. <clears throat> so hit continue. And OK. And that'll give me a new column with my three people marked as Mahalanobis outliers. And then. Um, Everything else will be zeros for not being an outlier. So for cooks here, so let me write sort descending for cooks. These are all positive. That makes it nice and easy. Um, so cooks is a measure of discrepancy and leverage together. And so remember, discrepancy is people who are far away from the data. Um, so there's a big gap between them and everyone else. And leverage is how much control they have over the slope. And so the cutoff score for cooks is, um, and I'll type this out so you can see it. <clears throat> Let me make the whole thing bigger. Yay. Okay, so it's 4 divided by degrees of freedom, which is n minus k minus 1. Okay. So in this particular example, that's going to be 4 divided by 265 participants minus 3 for k minus 1. And my math skills not so hot when you're talking about small decimals. So four, I don't know why it brought up that particular picture. It normally does the calculator for you. There we go. So 265 minus three minus one is 261. So four divided by 261 is 0.015. <clears throat> and let's go four decimals, 0.153. And then we're gonna do the same thing again. So transform. Um, recode into different variables. I'm going to reset this. So let's take cooks and make it the cooks outlier. Click old and new values. It's still ranged through highest because they're all positive. And we're going to go 0, 1, 5, 3 and make those people ones. And, and then all other values and make those people zeros. And then add. So continue and OK. <clears throat> so I have quite a few cooks outliers. So that is 20 people who are um, a combination of discrepant or leverage. And so I've got them all marked, but so far it looks like that overlap is only this one person who's an outlier on both. And then last but not least, let's do leverage. So the cutoff score for leverage. is 2k, remembering that k is the number of predictors, divided by 2k plus 2 divided by n. So that's 2 times 3 plus 2, which is 8, divided by 265. Go back to my calculator here. So I got 2 times 3 plus 2 divided by 265. So I got 0 0.0302 if I round up. So the cutoff score is 0 0.0302. <clears throat> now let's do this one more time. So transform, recode into different variables. And let's hit reset. We've got leverage values. So let's do my leverage outlier. Change. We got old and new values. Range value through highest. That's 0 0.0302. And the value is going to be 1. Hit add and continue. Oops, just kidding. 
old new values. Now let's also do all other values are zeros. Sorry, I don't want to leave it blank. <clears throat> we continue and OK. I forgot to sort leverage here, so let's sort that bad boy descending. So I have a lot of leverage people as well. So 30 participants who have a high leverage. So from there, what I want to do is pick the best, the worst two out of three. Well, that is still kind of hard to see. Um, it's pretty clear some of these ones at the top are two out of three, um, but which ones are they? So what you do, the easiest thing to do is transform and compute variable. So a lot of the transform window. And we're going to do an outlier sum, and I'm going to add these three columns together. So Mahalanobis outliers plus Cook's outliers plus leverage outliers. Hit OK. And then let's sort that descending. And now it's I can see that I have 13 participants who have um, at least two out of the three are bad. And these are the participants that I would want to exclude in my analysis if I decide to exclude outliers. Now let's do that. You don't have to, but you can. So what I'm going to do is save myself a new data set. And I would normally call these something um, better than one, two, and three, uh, but I'm just using this for the video example. Okay, hit save. Sorry. <clears throat> and I'm going to get rid of these people. So 13 participants deleted due to outliers, and when you write this up, you would explain that you used Mahalanobis, Cooks, and Leverage as your as your criterion for deleting those people. All right, <clears throat> so now that we've dealt with missing data and outliers, the next thing you would want to do is multicollinearity. So you don't want to waste your time using two x variables that are very highly correlated, and especially not when doing moderation, because then when you add the interaction, the multicollinearity gets to be too much, okay? and they might suppress each other. Or it might not run. So let's do analyze. Correlate, bivariate, just your independent variables. So you got a bunch of extra columns here, but just your three independent variables. So I got my GPA, my sessions, and my ACT score. Okay, and the ACT score one will be a point by serial because it's only two variables. And we're going to leave the DV out. You want them to be correlated with the DV. That's the point of regression. So we're not going to look at that correlation because that's what we're trying to do. Right, hit OK. Go back to my output here. And it looks like um, we're not at multicollinearity levels yet, but that's pretty high. The correlation between their GPA and their hours of attended sessions or study sessions is pretty high. So as GPA, scale GPA is going up, um, they're going to more sessions. And that shouldn't be too surprising because the smarter students tend to know that they need to study more. There's lots of research showing that uh, poorer students don't know that they sh when to get help until it's too late. Um, and so um, you often find that anytime you have optional study sessions, students who need to go don't. Okay. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a relationship between GPA and ACT score, which is a little odd. But that's partially um, because we've got this scaled as a, a, a categorical variable. Um, and so there is a correlation and it's negative. So the higher your GPA, the lower your ACT, or the more likely you are to be in the zero group, which isn't necessarily the best correlation to have, which is why I said I don't have um, a fantastic example for this particular video. Okay, because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> All right, but anyway, do we have multicollinearity? No, and that's good. I might worry a little bit about this 0.6 because that's um, 36 to 40 percent of the variance is starting to overlap, which is kind of a lot. So we'll see what happens. Um, the last piece is the assumptions. And we've actually already run them up here, and they're going to be kind of scary. Um, but I deleted the outliers, so I want to rerun it to look at assumptions again. So analyze, regression, and linear. You can just leave the whole thing set up. You will get extra Mahalanobis and leverage columns, but you can just ignore them. So I'm hit OK. And let's look at our assumptions. So do we meet multivariate normality? Well, that's kind of iffy. 
Um, one problem that you have is that most of the data generally is between two and two on a scaled residual. Um, and then you have you know, all these like dudes out here. So most of the data is actually centered over zero, which is what you'd want. And you've just got a couple of little residuals out here that are really bad out, um, outside of the data. Because we've deleted outliers, but they, the residuals are pretty high. Uh, so you might take some time to figure out who those people are and why they're so high. But I'd say this is probably okay given the fact that most of the data is here. And normality is usually considered um, robust to violations with at least 30 participants in the central limit theorem. And we have 200 and something, so we're probably okay. Now this linearity picture is not okay. <laughs> that is not linear at all. That's like the best example of a nonlinear graph <laughs> that I could have ever given you. That's starting to be log linear. Um, so linearity would not be good. So in general, this is where I'd stop and maybe try to do, to see if it's the, the zero, one variable, because sometimes that'll give you problems when you're using categorical predictors. Uh, and then I might consider trying to um, do non-linear regressions, so some non-parametric um, regression or maybe a log linear analysis, okay, or logit or probit, something different. Uh, so normality is probably okay, linearity is not. The last two are homogeneity and homoscedasticity. So for homogeneity, what you'd want to do is look at the zero line. You want to equal spread above and below zero, and it's not equal because there's um, it goes up to four over here and down to negative two over here, and there are clearly more dots over here. And then it's zero the other way, that two to six, which is the same problem with our um, normality graph. So probably not homogeneic. And then homoscedasticity is that you want the spread of the dots to be even all the way across the, the graph. And so I always tell students to draw a line around the graph, um, and it is not at all. It kind of makes a fish. Um, and so that's not good for you either. Now, there will always be one or two little dudes out there. Um, so we always joke about those in class, that these are your delinquent children. Um, but uh, mo this is still, even if I look at this, this area, it's not very good, especially because of the cluster of dots down here. Okay. So not the greatest example. I would definitely probably try to do this a different way. More than likely, I'd tell you to do an R and use a different distribution family than the normal distribution, like maybe a Poisson distribution or a, a log linear distribution. But since this is a demo of process, we're going to keep going. So there's my warning that I would not keep going on this, but to show you how process works for three-way interaction, I will. All right, so to actually run the analysis, let's say everything actually does look good, what you do is hit analyze, regression, and then process. I think I have the newest version of process, um, and this is SPSS 22. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, and so what we want to do is set this up. So it looks a lot like a regression window. It's just got more boxes. And what we're going to do is use um, x is going to be our ACT score, so our independent variable. Um, success is going to be our dependent variable, so y. Uh, let's see here. The GPA is going to be our M variable, so our moderator, and our second moderator is going to be W, which will be hours attended. Okay. If you stick it in covariates, it will it will only include it as a main effect. And while it looks like it can put extra things in M here, it doesn't like it when you do that. Um, and so we're going to use M and W. Now X, M, and W are going to all be entered as main effects and all of their interactions, so the order actually doesn't really matter that much. Um, but my idea, theoretically, is that the criteria for our scores should also should predict the success in the course. So this is the thing we actually use to determine whether or not students should go into that course. And then I have some other variables I want to see if they moderate that relationship. Um, so the reason I did them in this order was more theory-based. All right, uh, so let's pick a model number. We're going to pick model three, like we talked about a minute ago. So we're going to do double moderation or moderated moderation or three-way interactions, whatever you want to call it. Under options, we're going to pick the first four. So mean center for products to help us with multicollinearity problems. I pr pretty much always leave on heteroscedastic consistent uh, standard error errors, especially because our data is heteroscedastic. Um, ordinary least squares or maximum likelihood confidence intervals are always a good thing. And then generate data for plotting. 
which you can only use with the moderation models. So um, we'll use that to make our picture of the data. So hit continue. Under conditioning, I always like to ask for the Johnson Neyman. I think it's really cool. Um, it only works for models one and three. And then we want to, uh, you can change this pick a point thing. Uh, the traditional way to do this for simple slopes is plus and minus one standard deviation, but percentiles works as well. You just have to tell people what you're doing. So hit continue and then OK. All right. <clears throat> so let's take a picture of some of those and blow it up and talk about what everything is. So the first thing you're going to get is just a reminder of what you entered. Let's go back to this window. Find this a little easier to see because I can make it bigger. Okay. Okay, so it's reminding me what I've st stuck in each box basically. I'm down to 227 after deleting missing people and outliers. The very next thing down is the um, model summary box. This is akin to the model summary box in when you run a regular regression. And what that tells you is how much variance is accounted for by all of your variables, including the interactions. So we've got 11% of the variance. So I want to look at R squared. And then is that significant? So my F value is significant. So 11% of the variance is greater than chance, or greater than the mean of Y um, as the predictor. And um, I would list this when writing it up as F, and so it's 7 and 219. <clears throat> which I got from that very first row, DF1, DF2, it's 4.65, um, P is less than 0 0.001, and then I would do R squared, <clears throat> equals 0.11, and not in a top. So that's APA style. The next thing that happens is we're going to get the... Um, B values, so this coefficient here is non-standardized, so that's B. So we're going to get our regression coefficients for all of our variables. And so my GPA variable here is not significant, so it's not a significant predictor of their success in the course. So that is still predicting Y. Their ACT score is a significant predictor of success in the course. So that is that for every, for, this is a categorical variable, so for the one group, they're more likely to be successful in the course. Their course score is one point higher than the zero group. Not too surprising. Um, my first interaction, so interaction one, is not significant. And so let's see, interaction one is ACT by GPA. So there's no interaction between ACT and GPA. The hours that they study is significant, but it's negative, which is a little odd because people who are studying more should do better. But it may be that the people who are studying more at the end haven't been studying the whole semester. So I would need to look at like maybe some informal archival data to explain that relationship. Um, and then none of my other interactions are significant. So I've got um, interaction two here listed here. So it's ACT by hours. Interaction three, it's really, there's nothing there. It's a GPA by hours. And interaction four is all three at once. So ACT by GPA by hours. Okay. So none of those are significant, which is why I said this is not the best example, but <clears throat> we could talk about each one of these one at a time. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we want to list the coefficients for each one. How would I write that up? Well, the ACT score, you'll list B because it's the unstandardized coefficient, 0 0.0101. I list my T value. The degrees of freedom for T always match the F statistic, so it's 219 equals, and then I go over here to T, so 2.09, and then my p-value is 0.04. You can also list the upper and lower confidence intervals for B if you wanted. So that's the lower level confidence interval and upper level confidence interval, right? and it doesn't cross zero, and that's why it's significant. <clears throat> Okay, so we don't have any significant interactions, but if we did, there's a whole lot of buts in this, but you get the idea. Um, we would look at the next piece down, which is the conditional effects. So that's where it'll explain the interaction, if there is one. Okay. 
Okay, so what's going on in this graph? It's actually going to give you um, several different outputs, but mostly you're probably going to want to look at the um, conditional effect of x on y given the other two moderators. So the very top part here is understanding that three-way interaction. So it's got it broken down for you twice. Okay, if you just want to look at the interaction between um, <clears throat> x and m only, that is going to be this bottom part here. Um, and so you've kind of got the three-way part up here and then just that two, the conditional effect of x and m given different levels of w. So as a reminder, x in our example is our ACT cutoff score. Um, so it's a 0 and a 1. m is our GPA scaled. w is the hours they studied. All right, so how would I interpret this? Well, what's happening is in this first box, this top box here, it's going to tell me, um, I, it's going to create, it doesn't really create groups, so don't think about these as groups, but it creates slopes as if people were in groups for different levels. So if I make a little table of what's going on in this chart, so there's going to be nine rows I like tables. If you've watched my videos for any of my videos for a while, you'll see that I really like, really just love tables. All right. So what's the first thing? This is the, this is going to be hours here, GPA, and what happened. So for low hours, because that's the standard deviation is 4.67. So that's where it got a 4.97. Um, so that's what this number is. It's a one standard deviation below the mean, because these are mean centered. So the zeros here are the average group. And then the very next one over tells me I'm doing a low GPA. So for a low scale GPA, so 2.99 points below the mean. So if you wanted to know what the actual GPA for that was, you would go back and calculate what's the mean of this score. Okay, this is 2.9 points below that mean. So this is also low. So for people in the low hours and the low GPA group, what's the relationship between X and Y? So for our ACT group, um, what's happening is that the effect is 1.12. Okay, and that's not significant, it's sort of marginally significant. So ACT marginally predicts um, success. And remember that in this particular example, that means the difference between the two groups' success scores. So our, our one group, the people who have the higher ACT scores, are doing better. And it marginally predicts success. <clears throat> and all of these are positive, so they're all scaled the same way. So our groups are always doing better. So the next column down is still low here because it's still the negative hour score. And then I look at GPA, and that's average. So what we're going to do is work through each combination. So there's going to be nine of them. So for a low hours group and an average GPA group, what happens? Well, um, ACT does predict predicts success. And so the difference in the success scores is 1.30. Okay, so we're getting more, um, <clears throat> more differences between our groups. The next one, I'll get low hours and a high GPA, and our ACT score still predicts success. Okay. And so the scores are going up. It's 1.49 this time. Oops. <clears throat> so what does that tell me looking at this? For people who are not coming to sessions, as GPA increases, the relationship between ACT and success increases. And so as their GPA goes up and their ACT score crosses this threshold, the more likely we are to be successful. Um, and then this is only for the low hours group, though. So what happens when um, we move up to the people who are coming to an average number of hours? This is going to be three of those as well. <clears throat> so for average hours and low GPA, what happens? So average hours, low GPA, the effect is actually much smaller, and it's not significant at all. So there's no difference between the ACT groups. 
So essentially, as they come to more classes, that effect, the difference between them gets wiped out. Right? So that's actually a good thing. As they go to more of the study sessions, um, they're performing at the same level as their um, ACT, higher level ACT peers. Okay. So at an average, average group, so got average, average, um, it is significant, so there is now a difference. So um, while that he helps the low GPA group from a low average, um, and once we get into the average GPA group, an average number of hours, still we see a difference. So it does predict success. And our students in the um, above the criterion on the ACT are doing better. So an average high now this time, so average number of hours, a high GPA, so average high, it does predict success and the score is higher. <clears throat> Oops, typing. And so students are coming to an average number of hours and are in the high GPA group are doing better. Um, the, and then their HCT scores above the criterion are doing better. But if I look at this overall, the pattern, we get to the same exact pattern that as they go, as their GPA increases within the average group only for hours, as the GPA increases, the difference between my low and high um, ACT groups goes up, which is the same effect here. So these are increasing as GPA increases. And so that's one of the reasons why we didn't get the interaction is because the pattern is the same. While these numbers are physically different, the pattern of the slopes is the same. That as they're increase as the GPA is going up within each hours group, we're getting an increase in um, in the relationship between ACT and success. All right, let's do the last group. So people who are studying the most, what happens? So we're gonna get high and then a low, so what happens? So people are going to a lot of sessions on low GPA, there's no relationship between them. So it does not predict success. And then for a high group and the average GPA, so high studying, average GPA, that p-value is not significant. It's actually going down, but it's still not, there's no relationship. And then for the high group of average, I'm sorry, the high group of hours and the high GPA. <clears throat> so high, high, we get a marginal relationship, but again, look how small the difference is. Okay, so it's, um, this actually is decreasing in slope. So we didn't get the interaction, but it's, it's almost there because you're getting a difference the the slopes are going the other way for this group but it's not strong enough to show a significant effect Mar. and i feel like i mean i love tables but i feel like making this sort of table really helps you um sit down and think about what's happening because three-way interactions are tough they're confusing um and so this makes you break it down into groups and think about like what happens. So for low average, what is that GPA stuff doing? So as GPA is increasing, the relationship between ACT, ACT and success is also increasing. And that same pattern happens for an average group. Now for the high group, there's almost no effect of ACT on, um, on success. Maybe one small marginal piece, but really there's nothing going on. So if they're studying a lot, their GPA doesn't matter. If they're in the low average, if they're not studying very much in the low average group, the GPA is, matters a lot because the difference gets larger and larger as GPA increases. Um, and if they're in the average number of hours studied group, GPA matters, but the difference between the low and the high is not as strong. Okay, so thinking about like what's happening at each of these levels. The other thing you can interpret here is this conditional effect of, of X and M interaction at different levels of W. So this sort of collapses across GPA and looks at only hours. So um, I find this a little harder to interpret, but at a low number of average hours, the overall effect of GPA is 
um, 06. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry, that's not just GPA. At a low number of hours, uh, a low number of hours, can't talk today, um, the interaction effect of GPA and ACT is 0.06, and that's not significant. So this is this number here isn't one particular variable at a time, it's interaction of X and M together. Um, at an average number of hours, X and M together are still not significant, um, but it's 0.02. And so this is actually changing directions. And so at a high number of hours, it's actually a negative interaction. Um, this is nice to have, but it's this to me is easier to interpret the conditional effects of X on Y, because I can deal with one variable at a time. If hours is low and GPA is low, what happens between the relationship of ACT and success? So I find it a little easier because then I can I can collapse if I want to. So what happens at only low hours? Um, but <clears throat> interpreting these effect B effects for interactions can be kind of difficult. Okay, so that is how I would interpret the output. Now we didn't get a Johnson name in because of the non-significance uh, here. But what the Johnson Neyman will do is take this conditional effect box that we've spent a lot of time looking at and break it down even further. So you don't just get low, average, and high. You get um, different points along the continuum. So you get more of these uh, significant points. And it will tell you where things are and aren't significant. So it's really fantastic. If you watch my, um, my single moderation video, I have an example of the Johnson Neyman in there. <clears throat> Okay, so the last piece is this graph. Um, now, the newer versions of Pro... Oh, stupid warning. The double-click to activate makes me crazy. All right. Um, where did it go? All right. <clears throat> so, the newer versions of Process, which I apparently don't have installed on this particular computer, actually will give you some um, syntax to create these graphs, but it creates you scatter plot graphs. And so I always do these by hand instead um, because it tends to create a picture that I was more interested in. And so what we're going to do is take this data um, and enter it into SPSS. So I'm going to create a new SPSS window here. Not a new output, but a new window. So new data set pile it up next to Word. So what I'm going to do is instead of using these numbers, I'm just going to call it low and high. So this first column needs to be, let's go ACT score, label here, oops. Okay, and then we're going to do our hours score. So this is hours of study sessions. GPA, which is scaled GPA, since schools use different systems, and then our Y variable, which is success. Course success. Good thing I'm not known for my spelling. All right. <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is create uh, low and high values, and since ACT is only um, a zero and one score. It's only given me um, it's only given me zeros and ones for that. If it were a real continuous variable, it would give you um, low, medium, and high for or low, average, and high at that level as well. So, uh, in this particular example, I'm going to do zero for low, um, or actually, in this for my example, I could t do below criteria. <clears throat> because that's specifically what we're doing, but you could do low and then above criteria. What I'll do is enter one zeros until we have enough columns that we need. I'm gonna turn on value labels here so you can see that a little better. Um, and that's what this is representing. This is the low group, the high group, the low group, the high group. And we're gonna need Eighteen of those. And I find that easier because then it's labeled for me on the graph. That's one reason why I do this. Um, you can use these raw numbers, but then you have to go back and change them to be labels. So, 
Uh, under hours here, I'm going to do negative 1 for my low group, 0 for my average group, and 1 for my high group. And I like that coding because that's what those are. So it's one standard deviation above and below zero, but that also means that I can cut and paste it into my GPA column as well. So I put that in hours and GPA. Okay, so what I want to do is go back and enter. So I've got low, looks like six times. Oops, I did high. So that matches this low, average, high. Now in the GPA column, it's low, low, average, average, high, high. So I don't want to make sure I don't enter the exact same column twice for hours in GPA or your graph will not work and you won't know what's going on. So they will have different patterns in each column. And so these are um, the, we're just breaking it into two groups in a sense to be able to create this graph picture. And the data is really continuous, but this will help us make a picture, a graph. And then I would want to enter the Y hat scores. So these are predicted scores for people at each one of those groups. And this is where you got to type the numbers. So we'll do two decimals just to make it go kind of quick. You're as bad at typing things on video as I am. You should definitely get people to check your work. Our graduate lab has a whole wall of funny things that we have written in reports and not realized because we're all we all make mistakes. Okay, I got a line off somewhere. So we got 4.34, 5, 4, 3, 4.92, 1, 4.93, 5. Oh, there it is. So we got 385, and I skipped one here. It's 4.86. Let me make sure I hit the rest of them right. Perfect. Okay. So now how do I create this picture? We're going to use Chart Builder, so Graphs, Chart Builder. It's really grumpy with me because I haven't um, set the variable property, so I'm going to go back over here under ACT score, under measure, I'm going to make uh, that one's nominal, and then make the rest of them scale. Yep. Um, all right, now Graphs under Chart Builder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so here's Chart Builder. I'm going to make sure that you have these little variables, um, type of measured variable on there. We'll force you to do that first. We're going to pick line graph, and I'm going to use a multiple line graph. And it's actually not going to let me create a three-way interaction in one graph. So what we're actually going to have to do is back out of this first and do one extra thing. But let me show you... Um, let's go ahead and kind of set it up and you'll see why you can't do three three way interactions in one graph. Okay. So I could take, I want to always usually put X and Y in the places that I thought they were. So course success was Y. And X was my ACT score, but I might split my data on X. So let's actually put uh, GPA in X and hours of study in set color, which means I'm going to have to force that variable to be a... Um, a nominal variable. So you can right click on them. I'm going to click nominal just to make sure it can go into set color because set color requires it to be a nominal variable. Okay. Um, now the, you can move these around to, be, to sort of create the best picture. Generally I suggest to put X here and Y here because um, that way it matches the simple slopes that you are doing. But in this particular example because X is a um, a um, dichotomous variable, you might consider splitting everything on X. And that'll make more sense here in a second. But if I wanted to do it the way I've told you, I've told everybody else to do it, I might put my X variable here, and then actually my M variable, my scale GPA, here. 
Um, and there are lots of different ways to do these graphs, so yeah, it's kind of up to you. So let's hit OK. And that will give us the graph for above and below criteria, the relationship between GPA and success in the course. But now I'm sort of stuck because I don't have hours. So what you want to do is go to data and then split, uh, split file. And let's split on hours. So organize output by groups and then move hours of study into it here. So you could pick any one. I could split on ACT and look at people who are just below my criteria and people who are just above my criteria. I could split on GPA. So let's look at low average and high GPA. Um, or I could split on hours. So it kind of depends on how you want to sell the story and how you're going to talk about it in your output. Um, so whenever you're writing this up, uh, split based on the way you discussed it in your results section. So I'm going to hit OK. And now let's make that same graph. So graphs, chart builder, hit OK. Uh, and then I want to leave this actually the same. So don't split on a variable and then try to use it. It'll freak out. Um, but I'm going to leave all this the same and hit OK. And I'm going to get three different graphs. I'm going to graph for um, low, average, and high. Generally, it tells you, oh, here it is. It's at the top. Study session is low. So here is the relationship between GPA and success in the course given ACT score for low people only. And so you can see that as GPA, um, as GPA increases, it seems to matter for the people on the below the criteria, but above the criteria, not so much. Okay. Um, and then for an average number of group, we get almost perfectly parallel lines. So GPA is making a difference, whereas the, um, the low people are actually doing better in the course, which is sort of weird. Um, and so maybe but the study sessions aren't working like we expect them to. Remember, this is not the best data set. Um, and people who are above criteria are doing better than below, but there's no interaction because the slopes are parallel. And we see that almost the same picture here. So this is the one that actually has slightly the, the slopes are getting closer to zero. Um, and so they're a little flatter. So you're going to end up with at least three graphs, uh, maybe more if you have more than if you decide to do like um, two standard deviations above and below the mean or if you're doing some Johnson name and graphing. But that's probably the easiest way to graph them, given the output that you get for um, from process. So that's worked through the whole thing on a uh, three way interaction or moderated moderation using model three in the process plugin from data screening all the way through graphs, um, and then let me know what questions you have. <clears throat>